today, I would like to share grace with you as we're studying the Ten Commandments, and they are very important in our Christian lives because these commandments deal with relationships. Relationships are very important in our lives. Ten Commandments are really about making good relationships with our God and with our people. So the third commandment states this to us. Do not take the name of God in vain. So previously we saw how Moses asks the name of God. I mean, in order to keep and live by this third commandment, do not take my name in vain, we have to really first understand the gravity or the meaning of this name itself, right? And before Moses embarks on his spiritual journey as a spiritual leader for the Israelites for the Exodus, he asks God, what is your name? This was a heartbreaking question from God's perspective. This was like a child asking his father, I will call you my dad only if you tell me what your name is first. But the Israelites did not know any better because they were saturated with so many false gods in their lives for 430 years of abusive bondage of slavery in Egypt. And yet these false gods had names. So Moses had to get the name of this anonymous god called God of their fathers so that he could really convince his people that real God has come to deliver them. And for this, God becomes a God with a name. Our God did not have to have a name. But in the sinful world where people cannot differentiate true God from the pagan gods, God chose to become God with a name. This is for the sake of these poor children who are suffering from amnesia or loss of memory. They have become spiritual orphans because they have completely forgotten who their true God, true Father is. Therefore, he became a God with name. So Moses asks this question, what is your name? And God answers with this profound name, for self-revelation. I am who I am. Yahweh. This was an incredibly special name by which the children of Israel could now differentiate the true God from all the other false gods. This was the ultimate name, Yahweh, that would set them free from their abusive bondage of slavery in Egypt. But note that this was an expression that is only possible in a very, very intimate relationship, saying, I am, or I am who I am. For instance, if a parent calls home and a child picks up the phone and says, hello, the parent would say, hey, it's me, right? All the mothers and fathers here, right? That's what we say. What parent speaks on the phone saying, hey, this is John Doe, this is your father? Nobody does this. Can you imagine? God's heart must have been about to explode when he revealed his name, it's me. But to great sorrow, his children don't remember him. Therefore, you will see throughout the scriptures this recurring expression, know that I am Yahweh. In the English Bible, we will see the name Lord. Okay, Lord is a pronoun, right? It's, it's going to be just any name or title. But actually, in Hebrew language, it's Yahweh. Now, the Jewish people do not dare to utter this name of the Almighty, so they instead called it Adonai, which means the Lord. 
That's why we see the Lord in the Bible. Whenever you see English Bible from now on, you see the Lord. The word Lord is not Lord. It is Yahweh or Jehovah, as our choir sang. So he's saying, when he says Yahweh, it's me. I am. See, this name Yahweh bears significant messages concerning our relationship with our God. First, Yahweh signifies that he is the one and only God, and there is no other. And we see this verse many, many times throughout the Bible. Isaiah 42 verse 8 says, I am the Lord. Again, I am Yahweh. That is my name, God declares. And I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Isaiah 43 verse 11 says, Ah, even I am Yahweh, and there's no Savior besides me. Also, Isaiah 45 verse 6, The men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there's no one beside me. I am Yahweh. I am who I am, and there's no other. Isaiah 45, verse 18, thus says the Lord who created the heavens. Now, he is a creator of everything that we see and we don't see in this world. He says again, I am the Lord, Yahweh, and there is no one else. Do you hear our God's heart-rending plea for us to wake up from our amnesia and to remember him? The Almighty God who existed before heaven and earth. The Almighty God who is a true God, the creator who created you and me. Second, this name Yahweh signifies that the Lord, Yahweh, is the one who keeps all his promises. What a wonderful being that is, right? Anything he says, he will keep his promise. Hence, he is the covenant keeper. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord, Yahweh, again, he's reiterating his name, your God. He is a faithful God who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Before the Exodus, God makes sure to give this name, Yahweh, to Moses so he can become a good spiritual leader for this great exodus. And he makes very clear to Moses that Yahweh is the covenant keeper. And we see this in the Exodus chapter 6, verse 2 to 8. Therefore, say to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord. Again, he's saying that I am who? Yahweh. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know, again, I am the Lord your God. And I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give to you for possession. Again, I am Yahweh. Third, this name bears how God is a personal God. He is an intimate God who draws near to his people when he prays. He is a merciful and kind God who intervenes continuously throughout our personal lives as well as this long course of history of this world. So Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 31 says, Lord, Yahweh, your God, is compassionate God. He will not fail you nor destroy you nor forget the promise, the covenant with your father, which he swore to them. He does not only remember the covenant he made with us, brothers and sisters. He's telling us today he remembers all the covenant that he has, he has made with our ancestors and forefathers down up to thousands of generations. He is Yahweh, the covenant keeper. He is a merciful God who hears the painful cries of his people. As we see in Exodus chapter 6, verse 5, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel, therefore I have remembered my covenant. We saw that the name Yahweh embodies the following. He is the creator 
the one who gave us birth. Yahweh is a covenant keeper who heals and restores us according to his covenant. Yahweh is the personal God who cares for us and intervenes in our lives. All these attest to none other than this truth. Yahweh is indeed our Father who has begotten us, who heals us, and who cares and intervenes in our lives to the most detailed aspect. This is why blaspheming the name Yahweh or taking this name in vain is a great sin. The third commandment tells us, you shall not take the name of the Lord, Yahweh, your God, in vain. This word in vain means... Don't take God's name carelessly, lightly, or falsely. So we'll take a look at this more closely. Okay? There is a direct ways to take his name in vain, like using his name in vain. Also, there are indirect ways to take his name in vain. First, directly taking God's name in vain actually is found from the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 113 provides a long list of instances. And those who are interested in finding this out in more detail, please refer to the seventh book of His Redemption series. It kind of explains everything. First, directly taking his name in vain is not using God's name as is required. In other words, praying without believing is taking God's name in vain because God said in John chapter 14, verse 13 through 14, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Also, when we complain, when we are unsatisfied of, when we doubt about, when we abuse God's plans, or providences that is also taking his name in vain. And we see this a lot from the Israelites. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 27, it says, The Lord hates us. The name, this name, Yahweh, they use this. Yahweh hates us. He has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Right? They are linking this name, Yahweh, to being that will destroy them. How, what a great deviation from this, from the original meaning of the name. Also, in Numbers chapter 14, verse 3, why is a Lord, or Yahweh, bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So all of this is part of taking his name in vain. Also, there are specific laws, as we see here. Now, specific laws, they're like amendment to the, um, the um, or addition to the Ten Commandments. It's found in Exodus chapter 20, 23, and Deuteronomy 14. Now, these specific laws actually elaborate the actual third commandment. So it explains God's name by expanding its meaning. In other words, where God put his name. His name is equivalent to God himself. Psalm 75 verse 1 says, your name is near. That means actually God is near, right? Okay. So the third commandment also concerns where God put his name. What is the place that you can think of the most? Where did God put his name? Now we're talking about tangible world. the holy place, the sanctuary. In other words, the house of God. House of God is defined by the place where God put his name. Amen. So in Exodus chapter 20, verse 24, God says, amazing blessing. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. Amen. 
We remember God's name here. We are gathered here in his house. So we shall definitely be blessed today. Amen. Okay. Also, again, you see, the Bible repeatedly speaks a house that my name might be there. A house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. God's eyes may be open toward this house night and day, toward the place of which you have said, my name shall be there. This is why church is a very special place. God surely answers our prayers when we honor the house of God where he put his name. When we pray with the heart that yearns for the house of God, God blesses us. He answers us. This is why God commands his people to revere his sanctuary or respect the house of God as if we would respect the elders or adults. We see this in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 30. You shall keep my Sabbaths and, you see, revere my sanctuary. This word revere means to fear. Also in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 2, you shall reverence my sanctuary. And again, he states his name, I am Yahweh. So we must respect and treat all house of God with reverence as we would to God himself. We're not talking about just fearing the physical building itself, right? But because God's name is here, we are supposed to take good care, have a good, uh, honorable attitude toward our church. Even the bricks, the glasses, the walls, even the musical instruments here, the tables and chairs and gardens, we always take care of them and keep them clean and well-preserved. Another way of defining sanctuary is not just not cleaning. So I'm not just trying to obligate you to our Saturday cleaning sessions. Okay? But here, God says, defiling, we can also defile the sanctuary with our words, our deeds, when we speak evil against it. And furthermore, when we engage in inappropriate behavior in the sanctuary of God, is equal to taking his name in vain. Another place where God put his name is his angel. Angel means a messenger when it refers to people. Okay? So these are God's ministers, such as priests and the prophets. These are the people whom God empowers and sends his authority, wisdom, and commissions to fulfill his will. So what does God say about his angels or messengers? He says, be on your guard before him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgression, since my name is in him. However, the Israelites forget God's words and grumbled against leaders, right? So they grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and God said, when, you, when they grumble against you, they are grumbling against me. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20, God encourages us, put your trust in the Lord your God. Amen. And you will be established. But also he says, put your trust in the in his prophets, and succeed. Another place where God put his name is you. The people who are called by his name. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 10 says, So all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord, Yahweh, and they will be afraid of you. This, being called by the name of the Lord, Yahweh, was a confirmation that God was with them. It's a truly an amazing blessing of God's everlasting protection, his faithful caring to the very, very end. 
Therefore, we, the people of God, who are called by His name, have the duty to ensure that His name, Yahweh, is magnified in this world. Amen. So Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16 says, Special blessing for those who are called by his name. Your words were found and I ate them. Your words became for me a joy and delight of my heart. I have been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. This is the greatest privilege. People who are called by the name of God have this right privilege to eat the word of God. This is the greatest blessings, eating the word of God. Therefore, we live to magnify the name of the Lord. How do you do this? By eating his word, like what we are doing now. Our lives must magnify. And that is why Jesus taught us by putting this part as a very first part of the Lord's Prayer, right? Magnifying his name. What does the Lord's Prayer start with? Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is the very first part. Nevertheless, his name was profaned, as we read in our opening text today, over and over and over again by his own people. And history tells us this. So we're going to take a look at this briefly based on Ezekiel chapter 36. The story, the redemptive history behind the renewal of Israel. Now, how did the people profane God's name? Do you remember from our opening text? I mean, we just saw what is taking his name in vain is about, right? But more specifically, God says this. Their violation of the third commandment is equivalent to defiling the land that they're supposed to live in and so they could no longer live in it. When they're kicked out from their places, they become mockery among people. That is profaning the name of God. First, Israel profaned the name of the Lord, as we see in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 20. He says, they defiled the, the land by their ways and their deeds. And this was like uncleanliness of woman in her impurity. Now, this is referring to a woman's menstruation. Menstruation occurs when the egg is not being fertilized, not to bear uh, life, right? That's what menstruation is. And that was considered, considered unclean. And he says, therefore... I poured out my wrath on them for the blood which they shed. So we know hating our brothers is murder, right? So they shed so much blood in the land, and they also defiled it with their idols. And as a result, he scattered them among the nations, and they're dispersed throughout the lands. And when they came to the nations where they went, there they profaned God's holy name, because it was said of them, oh, these are the people of Yahweh, but... They have come out of his land. This placement from where we are supposed to be as a chosen people of God is the ultimate profaning of God's name. But it doesn't stop here. The hope begins. God does not abandon his people. And he acts for his name. It's all about the name Yahweh. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 21 through 23, therefore he continues, I had concern for my holy name, which the people of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. We can see that God is emphasizing it over and over and over again, how he or the people profaned his name. And he says, it is not for your sake, this is the important part, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things. In other words, He's saying that I am not doing this because you have done something. Okay? He's saying, but for the sake of my holy name, for his name alone, which they have profaned, I will show 
the holiness of my great name, which have been profaned among the nations. Okay. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord. This is the climax here. Israelites defile the land, they're kicked out of their land, and they're profane God's name, but he restores Israelites for the sake of his name, not for their good deeds. And by this, whole world will know that he is Yahweh. This is already set. This is how it's going to unfold. And the history of Israel in our life as well. So he says, then the nations will know that I am Yahweh, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you. In NKJV version, it says, when I am hallowed in you. It's not what you and I do. It's what he will do for sake of his great name, Yahweh. He will fulfill this amazing redemptive history despite our corruption, our shortcomings. He will surely, certainly, definitely fulfill this. This is a very special name. So God is hallowed. He hallows his own name by how? Restoring us. Hallelujah. He has to restore us for his name's sake. So Ezekiel chapter 36, 26 continues. He promises, this is where the new covenant comes, brothers and sisters. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you for my name. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. God is declaring that he will do all of this and we nothing. That's the power, the promise of name Yahweh. Verse 36, then the nations around you that remain will know that I am the one. I have, Yahweh, have rebuilt what was destroyed and replanted what was desolate. I, the Yahweh, have spoken and I will do it. Hallelujah. So will the ruined cities be filled with flocks and people? They will know that I am the Lord. This is a consummation of redemptive history. When you have time tonight, let's all turn to Ezekiel chapter 36 and read every verse by verse. Okay? And really feel the weight, this profundity of his name, Yahweh, what he's doing for sake of his name. His name is ultimately his covenant to us because he's the one who revealed to, to us. Right? Everything is for the sake of this name, Yahweh, this great name, the name of God's self-revelation, solely to deliver and restore us. And this name came to its fulfillment through this greatest name of all, Jesus. His name means, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, he will save his people from their sins, and he already came. And for this reason, Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 10 says, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. This highly exalted means the highest sovereignty, the power, and authority. Therefore, the name Jesus possesses the highest authority, and we Brothers and sisters are called Christians. Christians means followers of Christ. Christians have the stigma of his name, Jesus, in us. We have been sealed with his name. Let's look at the power, the authority of the name Jesus. We're going to go through this really quickly. You just have to just, just read along. First, demons tremble before the name of Jesus. Amen. We receive eternal life in the name Jesus. 
We are saved by the power of the name Jesus. When we pray in his name, Jesus, we receive our answers. Where two or three gather in the name of Jesus, God says he will be in our midst. Anyone who has left the houses, brothers, sisters, parents, children, or land, for his name, Jesus' sake, we receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. And you will certainly find a lot more in the Bible. Also, this great name is very important for us in the end time. Saints have only the name of Yahweh or Jesus to hold on to in the end time. Zechariah, known as the book of apocalypse of the Old Testament, says this, I, God says, will strengthen them in the Lord and in his name they will walk. So in the New Korean Standard Version, this walk is translated to they will proceed boldly and preceded by my name. Please have this confidence that God has already put his name on you, and you will walk more boldly, more defiantly for remaining years of your life, wherever you go, for God has said so. In Micah chapter 4, verse 5, though all the peoples walk each in the name of his God, I hope this will be our confession today, as for us, we will walk in the name of Yahweh, our God, forever and ever. Amen. So let's close with the final verse, the promise of his name. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, God says, For you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with the healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about freely like calves from the stall. May every moment in our life become the fulfillment of the carrier of this most magnificent name, the Lord Jehovah or Yahweh, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us live to magnify his name. Let's pray. Our Father God, what a privilege it is to be called by your name. What is, well, how privileged is this that you can call you as Yahweh, our Abba Father? Father, just as you have given your name to Moses before he embarked on this great journey of exodus, of the victory of God, we pray that you will engrave your name of life, authority, grace, and mercy, and covenant upon our hearts today. May we truly live every moment in our lives to magnify your mighty name, Yahweh, by always trusting you based on your word. For your word today taught us that no matter how difficult it may seem or how detestable our deeds may seem, you will, no matter what, restore us. And you are restoring us even right now for your name's sake. And we thank you for this. Help us to always thank you, therefore, in complete trust and confidence by relying on your name, Jesus. We pray all this in the name of our one and only Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's give all the glory to our Father.